Can you hear? All right. Mother, mother. <laughs> There's so much things that uh, we can say about our mother. Uh, praise the Lord for those of you who are blessed with moms, uh, to have moms, you know, at the... Uh, my mom is in Australia, so uh, I give her a text this morning, send her a picture and all of that. But uh, I know that this morning, I know some of you already have special for your moms. Uh, I know that uh, uh, some moms are already crying this morning. Not because it was hard, but it was just really touching. Hey, we talk about moms. Mom is special. Mom is very special. If this is your first time with us, we want to welcome you. We're glad to have you here today. And we have Takashi here from Japan, who just freshly come out of the book. If you work on their way, he's been with us uh, in New Zealand for a month. And uh, make sure you shake him with them, get to know him and all that, all right? He is from a church in Japan that his pastor uh, sent an email to me and uh, said that he is about to come and uh, looking for a, a Bible preaching church in Auckland. And uh, so he lives just right here in the Royal Oaks area. So. Uh, you know, he's not far away. So uh, good to have you, Takashi. Thank you. Thank you for being with us this morning. And uh, I know that we have a, a, a delight surprise with Abraham being with us. Why don't you sit with your mom? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you came here for your mom. She paid for your flight to come here, man. <laughs> it's always really good to have Abe back with us. Okay, this is a surprise, really. I didn't know. I didn't expect that. But uh, I know that uh, Auntie Jenny really appreciate that, and it'll be a very special Mother's Day for her, all right? How did you get here? <laughs> I'll talk to you later about it, okay? But it's always a delight uh, to always have to honor our moms. And uh, I know that um, being a mother is, uh, is not uh, an easy thing, isn't it? But the reward is unbelievably great, all right? And it was great. And uh, I know that uh, my wife, she's a mother of six children up in heaven. And so one day we're going to meet all our kids. I know there's at least one boy up there in heaven <laughs> who look like me in a way, okay? With the red hair, like Anna. So anyway, we'll find out when we get there. But it's always a delight, all right? I hope that you will uh, treat your mom well today. I know that most restaurants are booked up and everything, but uh, there's always a way, okay, to celebrate your Mother's Day with your mom. Make sure you give her a lot of hug and kiss and all that, all right? Moms, we honor you today. At the end of the service, we're going to recognize you, all the moms, and uh, we have special gifts here for you uh, that you can use uh, for uh, in your life and also to remind you that we love you and we appreciate you, all right? If your uh, children are not here today, uh, don't worry, we'll adopt you, okay? <laughs> you will have a child today here, for sure, okay? I want to continue our message series. I know that uh, usually I bring Mother's Day a message, but uh, I was just compelled to continue in this message. And I think that we're very relevant also, not just to uh, men, but to ladies as well. And you're going to see that later on in here, what I'm talking about. Turn your Bible, if you would, to 1 Corinthians in chapter 6. We're going to continue our message series on the, the gospel of the church of Jesus Christ. The gospel of the church of Jesus Christ. Today's message... I entitled it as the inward testimony, the inward testimony of the church of Jesus Christ. The inward testimony. Last week, in verse 1 to verse 11, we look into the outward testimony, how Paul was really concerned in regard to the church in Corinth. This is a very troubled church. The church was troublesome because first they have a disunity in that church that was addressed in the first few, uh, couple chapters. And then in regard of uh, the sin that's taking place in that church. But then last week we saw that the testimony, how they had a shameful testimony to the world, and especially in the city of Corinth. And the reason why, because it, there were issues among the brothers and sisters in Christ in the church. And they couldn't resolve that. They could not resolve the problem. So then they went out to look for a judge or for someone else to be the judge, to resolve their problems, the problem of the church. And this judge is not even a believer. And Paul was saying that it's a shame that you do that. It is a shame because it was saying it's the testimony out there for people that do not believe in God. They look at these Christians that are having issues and they say like, you know what, your God is not wise enough. Your God is not 
really having any much of a, you know, solutions to you. Look at you. Look at you. You have to come to someone like me who do not believe in your God and to solve your problem. And that's a shame. That's a shame. And so Paul reminded them last time in verse 11, if you look at it, is that such or some of you, but you were washed. You were, God has given you all this. You were washed, you were sanctified, you've been set apart, and then you've been justified. You are in Christ. You have been given everything in Jesus Christ. You have God's wisdom. Use it. Use God's wisdom to resolve any issues in the church. And by the way, don't forget. Any solutions that God has, any wisdom that God has to resolve problem in the church will always bring the church to unity. Do you notice that many churches today, or many churches for the centuries, when they have a problem in the church between members, what usually took, uh, take place? What usually happen? They're gone. They depart. They break the fellowship of the Lord Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ Himself, the Bible says, have joined them together. But they pull it apart because of embarrassment, whatever it is. I tell you this, when that things take place, it's not about Jesus Christ, it's about themselves still. Because when they depart, it says, it's me. I don't like it, I don't feel good about it. How about the Lord Jesus Christ? What do you think about it? It's always about the Lord Jesus Christ in the church. Nothing about man or woman or anybody else but the Lord Jesus Christ. So today we're going to look at the inward testimony of the, of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to begin with this saying, this phrase, and I want you to look at the back of my in the screen. Every day, everyone is demonstrating or testifying someone in their life. Get this in your mind. If you would go to the next slide, please. Oh, nobody's firing this slide. Thank you. All right. Every day, everyone is testifying or demonstrating someone else in their lives. How many of you understand this? I want you to think about a moment here, okay? Think about this for a moment. We think about mothers. You know that moms have so much influence in every one of our lives. Do you agree with that? Moms have so much influence from the moment when the baby being carried like that, an infant, and then growing up to be a toddler, who usually spent more time with that child? Mom. Mom. I learned a lot of things from my mom. I learned some things from my dad too. <laughs> But when you're talking about everything else, you know, if, I think my thinking is this, like, you know, my dad would teach me all the things about the intellects and everything, such as man. Man is always about the brain and the logics, you know. But I tell you this, if it's just about brain and logic, we'll be lost. Because mom teaches us about the heart. Mom teaches us to understand. Mom teaches us why we do what we do, right? And some dads too. I'm not going to discount the dads. But mom's usually the one that always, you know, giving all these advices and things like that. But then here is this. Now that you are an adult, that you are teenagers and adult, let me ask you this. The way you are, where does it all come from? Who you are today has been made by your mom, isn't it? By your mom and your dad. The Bible says, teach your children. Teach them the word of God so that they will not depart from it. So that the things that you teach them, It'll just be in their lives. You know, this is part of human nature, of human being. Every one of us is testifying someone else or someone in their lives. And it always a reflection. You know, because the reason being because every one of us is made and conformed into a certain image, image, personality, character, and behavior by those who influence our lives. Christians. We are those also that have been made and conformed in the image of Jesus Christ. That's a Christian. That's why the name Christian. Christian is mean little Christ. Little Christ. Which means that we are living the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we discover in the previous passage of the outward testimony, the inward testimony is also as important as the outward testimony. As a matter of fact, the inward testimony is so important, more important than the outward, because the outward will be the reflection of what is in the inside. Too many times we're so concerned about on the outside, isn't it? Our clothing, our makeups, our, you know, whatever that people can see on the outside. But the truth is, everything on the outside is a reflection of the inside. My children, when they said like that, I have a friend who's just very, have a bad mouth. 
And I always tell them, remember what the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever that is the mouth says, that's what the person really is in the heart. So I said, that, you know, don't worry about what they're saying. Pray for that person, for their friends, that God will change their life on the inside. Maybe God will use you one day. So let's look at this in verse in chapter 6 of First Corinthians, in chapter uh, verse 12 to verse 20. And we want to look at this, that uh, we're going to observe two things today, this morning, out of this uh, verses, two things that Paul wants to emphasize in regard of the inward testimony of the church of Jesus Christ. And that's you and me. Let's read that. Turn your Bible, your Bible, look at it in verse 12 to verse 20. As I read it, I want you to follow along with me, if you would, please. All right, verse 12 begins with this. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but, the, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by His power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. And or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Verse 18, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not of your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore, Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Let's pray. Now, Father God, we pray in this few moments that we have, may we be focused upon you. We pray may the delivery of your word will not be hindered this morning. That we will understand what your word has to say in regards of your church, the inward testimony of your church today. Now, Father, we pray if there's anyone here who do not know you yet, may they see you of the Savior, Christ the Lord, who is the truth, the only truth, the only way in life. We pray, God, this morning that your will to be done in this place as it is in heaven. So we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and all God's people say, Amen. 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 Two things really quickly I want you to see you this, this morning. First, I want you to see the destructive testimony of the church. The destructive testimony of the church. The word is very negative, isn't it? The word destructive means something that is going to crumble, something that is damaging. And destruction usually happens, sometimes not just right away, it's a gradual thing. So there is the word destructive, means that it is something is in progress. I want you to pay attention to this beginning in verse 12. Paul, Apostle Paul, begins this paragraph with the phrase, all things are lawful for me. All things are lawful for me. So many people, or even Christians today, or churches, they take this phrase out of the context and say like, you know, we have freedom in, in Jesus Christ. So everything is lawful for us, right? We can do whatever we want. Everything is lawful for me. But then how about what Paul says in Romans 6 in verse 1 to 2? Romans 6, it says, then what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Hey, can we just continue sinning because then our sins have been forgiven. Now, yesterday's sins, today's sins, and forever sins is forgiven. So let's just continue in sin so then the grace of God will, God will be abounding. Paul says, certainly not. How then those who already died of sin and live any longer in it? How could you die in your sin and continue to live in your sin? Have you ever seen people, the so-called Christians, quote-unquote, they said that they believe in Jesus Christ, but they're still living in their sin and enjoying the sinful life. Making one ask, he says, 
what do you what do you understand about having a relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you really know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? That's a question we can ask sometimes. I believe when I look at this phrase of all things are lawful for me, I could not find it anywhere else in the scripture. I cannot find it anywhere else in the scripture. So then I digging some resources and I found that that this phrase, all things are lawful for me, it's a it's a slogan. You know what a slogan, right? It's just a word, a phrase that people believing in things, you know, like their philosophy. So it's like, hey, for as long as I don't, you know, break the law of the land or the law of the country, if I, you know, if I just, you know, like for example, drinking is nothing wrong. In some countries also that the drugging is not wrong. Right? Because the government doesn't stop it, and we can do that. Hey, um, having a prostitute, you know, having a, uh, just having that kind of life is not wrong because the government says it's okay. Right? Oh, just go to a strip bar. I mean, watching woman, naked woman dancing, it's okay because the law, it's okay. Government says it's okay. That was a popular phrase that a lot of people in, the, in, the, in, in Corinth, I believe, used. To excuse themselves to do whatever it is to please them. Have you ever seen or heard Christian people say that we have, a, you know, we have freedom in Christ. We can do things that, uh, you know, that's okay. On the gray area, I mean, the gray area is all right. I mean, we can do that, right? It reminds me of an old uh, preacher back in the days, uh, Charles Spurgeon. Have you heard that name before? He's a great mighty man of God and all that. He had a habit of smoking cigar. Until one day, he was in England, and he was just uh, walking about or something, and he saw a commercial or advertising on the wall. And it says, the cigar that Tall Spurgeon smokes. And then he stopped there, and he threw everything. He gave up the cigar. Why do you do that? Because it's, of, it's causing a stumbling block for God's testimony to be testified by this man who is a, a, a preacher of God. You know? The Lord Jesus Christ has given us freedom in Him. Look at it with me in John, uh, in John in chapter 8, verse 34, 36. The Lord Jesus Christ said, Most assuredly I said to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in a house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, talking about the son of God, Jesus Christ makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So the question is, what did Jesus Christ free us from? He does not free us so that we can do whatever sinful it is that we have, but He freed us from the bondage and the power of sin and death. So here's the question for you. If Jesus Christ had died on the cross, gave His life to give us with a freedom from sin and death, from the power of sin and Satan, so here's the question. Why do we want to go back again to it? Why do we want to crucify the Lord Jesus Christ again? And again and again by living back into the sinful life. Romans chapter 3 verse 22 it says, But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. To Christ Jesus our Lord. God has given us life, freedom from Christ, uh, freedom from sin, freedom from the power of Satan, and then we are now in Christ's eternal life. So why do we want to go back there again to the old life? And then Paul continued in verse 12. All things are lawful for me. And then he rebuttaled this idea or this slogan. He says, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me. But I will not be brought under the power of any. If you have your Bible, underline those two phrases. But all things are not helpful. And the second one I want to underline is, but I will not be brought under the power of any. The word helpful in there, in the text, in the original text of the Bible, is the word profitable. 
profitable. In other words, all things are lawful for me according to the law of the land, perhaps, but not all things are profitable to me for the sake of God. Not everything is profitable for me. I'll give you an example, all right? I like fellowshipping with the guys. I like going fishing with the guys. I like watching basketball with the guys. You know, guys time, right? How many of you like that? A lot of guys are like, no, I don't see what I want to say. You know? <laughs> Honey, I'm going groceries. How long did it take? Two hours, okay. <laughs> Coming home with just a block of cheese in about two hours, all right? <laughs> Hey, nothing wrong, isn't it? Hanging up with the guys. Right, guys? Is there anything wrong with that? No, no, no. But if I hang out with the guys every night and forsaking my wife, there's something wrong. So, yeah, it's lawful for me to hang out with the guys. Nothing wrong. We have nothing, you know, can hurt us in the fellowship. It's great, yeah. But if it's doing that to neglect my wife and my family, then it is not profitable. For me and for us. And guys, I'm not discouraging you from fellowshipping, but don't abandon your family. That's the point to it. There are many things that are lawful, but they are not profitable for us to live in Jesus Christ for His honor and His glory. I want you to look at this, what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 to 9. Philippians chapter 3, Paul's testimony, listen, he says, But what things were gained to me in the past, what gained to me, is that these I have counted loss for Christ. Counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus our Lord. Did you get that? Paul said that the things that used to be gained to him, what was that? Previous verses before that, he was talking about his reputation. Talking about, you know, he was the Hebrew of the Hebrews. He is the, he's almost like the holiest of the holiest among all the Jews and among all the Pharisees. He was the man of the law. He was the cover boy or cover guy, <laughs> if you know what I mean. He was exalted among other men, but he said, I counted all those as lost. For Christ, I count them all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as, here's the word, rubbish. In the King James Version it says, I count it as dung. Dung. That I may gain Christ and found and be found in Him. Church, listen to this. Then perhaps you have some things in your life that are, seems to be lawful. Not against the law, but doesn't give, uh, harm anybody, you think. But listen to this. But if it, is, if it is taking something out of your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, or to corrupt, or to corrupt the testimony of the living Christ in your life, then let me ask you this. Who do you love the most? Love yourself, or do you love God most? And if you love God more than anything, then for the sake of the excellence of the testimony of Jesus Christ in your life, cut it off. Get rid of it. I know some of you are having a hard time with that. Maybe it's a, it's a personal hobby that you had it for so long. It's like a part of your flesh that you're like, oh, I enjoy this so much, and you can't help it you just have it. Maybe you need a brother or sister in Christ to come to your house and to help you. I've seen people like that. They said, like, hey, pastor, or, hey, man, brother, hey, can you help me out, come to my place? I got something that I just kind of get rid of myself, and uh, uh, I need your help, you know? Please do that. He said that I, may, that, I, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Apostle Paul then continued. In verse 18, he addressed the issue of the heart. He said this, verse 13, Foods for the stomach, and the stomach for foods. All men is amen. Alright? Right? Amen. Yeah, that's right. You like eating, like me. I like eating too. But God, he says, but God will destroy both it and them. <laughs> that's the sad news, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> Alright, person's like, yes! 
you know, food for the stomach, stomach for the food. But God will destroy the word blood in there is not a good use for men. <laughs> but use it, you know, Paul used this illustration of food and stomach. And I was wondering why is that food and stomachs in relationship to the next part of them it says, now the body is not for sexual immorality. What is there anything to do with food, stomach, and sexual immorality? If you go back to the time of Genesis, when, when Satan tempted Eve first time, remember that? There were three areas that Eve was tempted in, and there was first one, it was the eyes, and then the second is the belly, and then the mind. So what was that? The, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the mind, which is to be wise or wise as God. Those three things are always the temptations, the weapons of Satan even till today. And unfortunately, many Christians have fallen into that categories. Doesn't matter how it looks like today, there's so many brands about that, but if you look at sin in the core of it, it's all about those three things. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Those always the three things. So then what about the foods in the stomach? They were saying that the way to get to the man's heart is by his stomach, his belly. Yes. And you know that is so true. If you notice the, the, the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, when he, went, when he went around Jerusalem and in Judea, do you notice that, that wherever he went, there was always food? Yes. Why is it? Because food always brings fellowship. Food always brings the heart of people to be open, to be softened. So if you want to minister to someone who's very prideful, bring them some Texas chicken or KFC. <laughs> if you're dumb. You know, <laughs> bring it along and then they'll be like, oh, yes, yes, yes. What do you say again? You know, and then as, they're, as you're talking and they have chicken in their mouth and their heart will melt with the chicken and the grease with it. <laughs> but then here it is, it says food for the stomach and stomach for the food. Why is it? Because food is really, food is really for the purpose to sustain people to live. It's to strengthen them for their body. But then it says God one day will destroy both of them. What does that mean? It means like both of those, the stomach and the food, doesn't last for eternity. It's only for this time, right now, right here. How many of you eat more than three times a day? Yes. <laughs> the rest of you laugh, okay? <laughs> nice, no, kidding. I know some of you only eat once a day or twice a day. I know you suffer yourself for the sake of Christ. That's okay. But you know, people eat. Why is it? Because the stomach and, and, and sometimes even, sometimes you're not really hungry, but do you ever notice that kitchen, kitchen is always the place to go? Isn't that true? When you get up in the morning, <laughs> you go to the kitchen. All right? When you come home from work or from school, oh, especially kids from school, they go straight to the kitchen. They drop everything right there in front of the kitchen table, whatever, at the ta dining table, and they ran to the food first. They look for the food. They are hungry as. Think about this, Roman guys. There's nothing to do sometimes with spirituality. It's just the nature of it. The flesh requires. But then the question is, what is anything to do with sexual immorality? Let's look at that verse again. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. Before I expose on that passage, I want you to understand this one thing called sexual immorality. Okay? Sex is not a word that like to be spoken in the churches. Right? How many of you learn about sex in the church besides IBCC? How many of you learn about sex from your parents? Wow. How many of you learn about sex from somewhere else? All of us. Hey, many of us. You know, parents usually like, oh, no, don't talk about sex. Sex is bad. It's terrible. Sex is evil. I like what they ask the parents. says, how did I come about, Mom? <laughs> You know, a lot of people think that it's a worth thing, a bad thing. Look at it in Genesis. It's a God's gift. Satan has turned it into immorality. God gave that as a gift to whom? Specifically, only, only to those who God has ordained to be husband and wife. 
What's the purpose of sex? In Genesis chapter 2, it says, And the two shall become one flesh. In other words, uh, sex is God's gift 